And now I start the recording. Voila. Okay, let, let's wait a second that people um, join us. That's always very exciting to see the number of participants increase exponentially. <laughs> <laughs> and then a flattened curve. Eh? And then it flattens. <laughs> okay, we're already at 100. We already, we reached 100 already. Very good. Yeah. Okay, we are almost at 200. Okay, let, let's wait another second or two because the numbers are still, are still increasing. Okay, I think now it's slowly flattening the curve. <laughs> we'll reach 200 in a few seconds. And then uh, let's reach 200 and then we start. 190. Okay. Okay, it's, uh, it's flattening at 195. Okay, I think we, we, we can start. We waited a minute. I think everybody will be, will be here just now. So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this um, new edition of, um, of, of Data at Breakfast. And this morning, uh, we have again with us Dr. Richard Lessels, who gave the first uh, uh, data breakfast devoted to, to the COVID team that interests all of us. And uh, during his first data breakfast, he promised um, a follow-up, an update <laughs> at, after a few weeks. And, and, he, and here we are with, with the first update on, 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 on COVID-19. For those of you who were not with us, uh, the first uh, webinar of, of, of Richard, Dr. Lessels is an infectious disease specialist at CRISP, which is uh, based at UK Z10. He studied in, in the UK <clears throat> and has a PhD from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Yeah? Since 2007, he, he has been working in, uh, in KwaZulu-Natal, mainly uh, performing research on HIV and, and, and TB. Yeah, he's now uh, one of the pillars of the UK's 10 COVID uh, war room and, um, and is assisting also the, the local response to the, to the epidemic. Yeah. So Richard, we are very happy to, to have you again with us this morning and, I can, uh, and you can take over from here. Maybe before, before you start, uh, just for, for those of you that maybe have not uh, joined us in these webinars before, there is a question and answer uh, facility at the bottom bar, I think it's the second button from the, from the right, yeah, where you can, where you're most welcome to pose your, your questions. And, and Tulio de Oliveira, who is also based at CRISP, Will will assist with the with the moderation of the questions after the presentation of, of Dr. Lessons. Yeah. So Richard, now it's over over to you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Francesco, and and thanks to you and your team for for managing to keep this up on a on a weekly basis. And and I think it's really helping to to keep people informed and to. Uh, keep the questions flowing and to, to understand what the questions are that, that, that people have and that, that we need to answer. Uh, are, are you seeing my slides clearly? Yes, Richard, it's perfect. Thank you very much. Right. So, so again, a, a bit like uh, last week, I, I don't want to talk for the whole hour uh, this time. I want to just, just walk through a, a few slides probably for 15-20 for minutes and leave lots of opportunity for questions and, and hopefully some answers to the questions um, because I think this is a great opportunity for, for that kind of dialogue. So really with the slides I just want to, to walk through an, an update and again most of these are showing uh, graphs and figures created by uh, the group that Francesco and Tullio have put together, the, the Big Data Consortium, um, which is uh, analyzing the data coming, coming out from the Department of Health and the NICD and the NHLS uh, to, to kind of help us understand the epidemic and, and what's happening. So just thanks, thanks to all the hard work of that consortium uh, that, that you'll see here. So some of you may have 
heard my talk, which was now four weeks ago, uh, which was the first data breakfast on, on COVID. And then I was highlighting to you the, the quite incredible speed of growth of this epidemic. And that, at that time, there were just about half a million cases around the world. So just to bring you up to speed with where we're at now, we're now at about 2.7 million confirmed cases. And the epidemic is, is affecting virtually every country in the world. Um, and we're getting close to about 200,000 deaths. And just a reminder that it's now coming close to four months since we, since we first detected a problem or first recognized a problem in, in Wuhan in China. So I thought it worth at this stage just putting this epidemic or pandemic uh, in a little bit of context. And uh, some of you will know that, that there have been uh, other coronavirus pandemics um, one in the past and one that's still ongoing, like the COVID. And there have been a few uh, influenza virus pandemics. And so I, I, I thought it useful just to put COVID into the context of these other respiratory virus pandemics. So on, on this table, you see here the three different coronavirus pandemics. So initially there was the, the SARS epidemic back in 2002-2003 and then the, the MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus epidemic, um, which is still not completely uh, ended. But you can see that COVID has, has already uh, significantly, uh, a significantly greater burden and impact that, that those two epidemics had. And so we're really now in the realm of comparing with some of the large flu epidemics. Um, and you can see here, these are the four kind of major influenza pandemics. Um, and we're already at the level or at a similar level to the number of deaths from the swine flu epidemic, the most recent epidemic in 2009. And I think that as you appreciate the growth of this epidemic, you can see it's probably, unfortunately, not going to be long until we uh, exceed these other two epidemics, the Asian flu and the Hong Kong flu. And so that's why you hear now people really stressing that um, this is going to become an event that the, pa the, the parallel may be the Spanish flu uh, pandemic of 1918 to 20, and therefore that, that this is kind of the, the biggest challenge, certainly in terms of respiratory virus pandemics that, that we face for several generations. So just to focus in on, on South Africa, and here we see the, the curve of confirmed cases over time. This is on a, on a standard scale, not a logarithmic scale, just from the time that the first case was reported uh, back about uh, seven weeks or so ago now. And, sorry, overlaid on this is just marking the time points, the two main time points. The first one from the national state of disaster was, was announced and various initial uh, measures were put in place, some physical distancing measures, uh, the travel restrictions, uh, the, and, and subsequently the school and university closures. And then later on, the, the implementation of the lockdown at the, at the end of March. And so I think you can see here with this curve, you can see this initial exponential rise in the number of confirmed cases. And then something happens here, which happens just after the lockdown starts um, of this flattening here. And since then, there's been a, 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 a more gradual increase in the number of confirmed cases. 
And I think just over the last few days this week, I'm seeing a potential upturn in the number of cases again. And certainly last yesterday, uh, with over 300 cases, I think that, that was the highest number of cases in a single day that we've had yet. And just a reminder here that I think that most people understand this now is that we think this, this change in the curve at this stage, it's too early to have been primarily due to the lockdown because we know that the cases happening on a certain day are reflecting transmission at least a few days before, if not a, a week or two before, because of the incubation period of the virus. But what we think is that this flattening may, in, at least in some part, have been due to the earlier measures put in place um, around the time of the national state of disaster. What does it look like at a, at a province level? Um, and thanks to Ilya for, for this graph, uh, which is, he's producing on a daily basis and, and, and is interesting to follow. So, so here you're just seeing the, the growth in the number of confirmed cases uh, by each province. And KwaZulu-Natal is the green uh, line here. This red line, and I think you've heard this week that there's a, there's a concern about the increase in the Eastern Cape. And I think you can see that here, that initially the growth there was quite slow and something has happened that it's, that it's accelerating there. And the Department of Health and NICD have sent, sent a task team to the province to try and get a handle on that early on to understand what might be happening. The, the two provinces with the most number of cases have been Hauteng and, and Western Cape, of course. And again, with Western Cape, you, you get a sense that there may be a, an acceleration there uh, just in the, in the past few days. And these dotted lines that are overlaying are just showing you the, the, the doubling time. Um, and and this, this line here is saying that the doubling time of the epidemic is around four days. Um, and so that's just to give you a sense of, of the rate of growth of the epidemic. Just to put this, put the, the, the national data in context and just to, to, to think about where we thought we were heading and uh, what this slowing and this flattening has, has, has meant. This is following our curve uh, along with the curve of another country, the United Kingdom. Um, and showing what happened to the United Kingdom uh, over time. And this is the number of days since the 100th case. Uh, and, and, and remember, this is, this is quite common in the graphs to, to, to measure from the 100th case, because that's basically the time when, in most countries, you know there's, there's transmission, local transmission happening. Uh, and so, it's often a better marker than starting from the, from the first case or from zero cases. This is a logarithmic scale again, and the, the dotted lines are again uh, showing you the, the kind of percentage rate of growth. And you can see here that we were heading on a very similar trajectory to the UK initially, uh, somewhere between 25% and 33% uh, increase in, in, in growth. And then this point that things flattened out a bit, we really diverged uh, from what was happening in the UK. And so if we hadn't done that, and if we'd followed exactly the same trajectory, we'd now probably be sitting somewhere around 50,000 cases. So just to give you a sense again of, of what this change in the, in the epidemic has, has meant for the number of cases that that might have been happening now. This is just putting into context of a few other countries, and this is, this is now Maria's work uh, from, the, from the consortium. And again, here we're showing the number of days since the 100th case on both graphs, and then the, the cumulative number of cases on a, on a logarithmic scale again. 
I'm just comparing it to a few different countries this time. So on this left graph, you have the UK again, but you also have Italy and the United States. I'm just highlighting that the, the, the trajectory has been fairly similar in, in those countries. And so it highlights again how we've, how we've got a different trajectory. And then on the right, looking at some of the, some of the countries that so far have more successfully uh, contain the epidemic. So we have Singapore, we have Japan, and we have South Korea. And we see, again, a slightly different trajectory uh, that Japan and Singapore um, had, a, had a more steady growth from the, from the beginning or from the 100th case. Um, and South Korea had a, had a kind of later change in their curve. So really just highlighting that um, South Africa is uh, different from, from most other places. And primarily that's, that's due to the, to the early response, the very early response. And if you remember, the, the lockdown was, was actually announced before we'd even had one death in this country. And so significantly earlier than, than many other countries. How are we doing with testing and, and how does this, this change in the, in the number of cases relate to the testing that's happening? This is a graph that is a little bit complicated, but what we're showing here in the bars is the average daily number of, of tests performed over a, over a week. Okay, so, so each bar here is a week coming right up to, to this past week. Uh, here, and this is the average daily number of tests. And then overlaid on that is the proportion or the percentage of tests that are positive. So if we just look at the number of tests being done, you can see that initially when, when the first case was announced, we were obviously not doing very much testing. Uh, it was quite limited then to, to people that, that had traveled and, and returned from places where there was transmission. Um, and then it, it quite rapidly scaled up, leveled off a little bit. But I think what we've seen in the last week is, is a very significant increase in the, in the testing being done. And uh, I know Kanye's on the line, she can correct me on this, but I think yesterday uh, they were, we were very close nationally to 10,000 tests being done. So quite a, quite a substantial scale up in the testing. And of course, that's driven by having to have the capacity and to have the demand for testing. And so that's an impressive scale up in the laboratory capacity to be able to deliver that. And I haven't got a graph, but I, I think some of you may have seen graphs in the, in the, in the Department of Health daily reports and in Prof. Abdul Karim's presentation that what we've seen over the past few weeks is the, the public sector or the, the NHLS laboratories really taking over from the, from the private sector in terms of the numbers of tests being done. So now the majority of the tests being done uh, I think are, are in the NHLS laboratories. When we look at the percentage, although there's a little bit of change here, there's not been a great deal of change that uh, we're finding about two to three percent of tests are positive. And so what does that mean if we remember that the, the people that we're testing are, are people uh, with an acute respiratory illness. So people with symptoms of cough or sore throat or uh, breathlessness or fever. Um, and initially, we obviously had some restrictions on, on, on who could be tested based on travel or contact or recent hospitalization. Now there's, there's, there's no restriction and, it, and it's anyone with an acute respiratory illness. So what this is telling us is there's a lot of acute respiratory illness that is not COVID still. 
and amongst those who were testing, it's still a minority that, that actually have COVID disease. So again, useful just to put this in some context of, of what's happening elsewhere, because that can tell you things about the epidemic and about the response to the epidemic. And this is just a graph with a few different countries. And it's essentially showing the same thing of the, of the percentage that test positive, but it's done in a slightly different way. So here, the, the measure is the number of tests per confir confirmed case. So you can see South Africa here is at about 40. So we do about 40 tests per confirmed case. So you can see that's just another way of saying we have a test positivity of about 2.5%. You know? And you can see that we're somewhere in the middle if you have this comparison with, with other countries. If you look at Vietnam, they're doing a, a phenomenal amount of testing for the number of cases that they're finding. And I was just looking again at Vietnam last night. They've, they've done a fairly similar amount of tests to, to South Africa, a little bit more because they, they started early on, but, but broadly similar number of tests. But they have very few cases, and in fact, they have no death yet. So Vietnam looks to be another big success story. Um, and again, probably because of what it learned from earlier epidemics and, and the preparedness that they have there for respiratory virus pandemics. The same is true of Taiwan. And then, and then New Zealand and Australia are also doing a lot of testing for the, for the number of cases that they find. When we go to the bottom of the, of the league table, we see here my own country, the United Kingdom, where the testing is still quite restricted. And um, they initially uh, had a policy where uh, you didn't need to be tested if you were symptomatic. And, and that um, you just isolated yourself um, for seven days or, or 14 days for some people. Um, and the testing has, has been rather slow to, to increase. So if you translate that to a percentage, roughly about 30% of the people that are being tested in the United Kingdom are, are positive. So this is a, it's a slightly difficult measure because it depends on many things. It depends on, on how much disease there is throughout your country, on how targeted your testing is, to what extent you know where the cases are, um, and also your capacity to do the testing, of course. But this is something that, that we are just following quite closely because we, we believe that it, it tells us something about the, the epidemic. I want to just spend a few moments just talking about the deaths now, uh, and we haven't really focused on that in the previous data breakfast talks. And of, of course, it's still early days with the deaths, uh, and we're sitting at 75 deaths in South Africa at the moment. Obviously, at that level, uh, there's still um, a lot of concern when, when any death is reported. Um, and of course, we want to prevent as many deaths as possible. But the reality is this epidemic is going to cause a, a great deal more deaths in, in every country that it's, that it's affecting. But again, what we see here, this is the, this is the number of uh, deaths on a logarithmic scale again. And this is the number of days since, since the third death, essentially. And again, without going into the detail, you can see to some extent these two different trajectories. So you can see this kind of trajectory here of some of the major European countries, the UK, Italy, France, uh, even Germany, Spain, and the United States, which of course now has the, the highest death toll uh, by some distance. And then you can see these other countries here, which, which seem to have a different trajectory to that. 
And again, we're, we're seeing here some of this success stories, South Korea, Japan, uh, Taiwan uh, has, has kept a remarkably low number of deaths, Singapore too. And then these other two countries that, that I showed with the testing, New Zealand and, and Australia. And so I hope you can see it because it, we're in a bad color here, but we're in the faint purple color here, South Africa, um, that seems to be following uh, this trajectory at the moment rather than this, than this uh, high growth rate here in the number of deaths. I want to show you just uh, this graph produced by the, by the MRC, by the Burden of Disease Research Unit, and not because we expect to see something here, but something that will be very interesting to follow over the next uh, few weeks and months. This is now looking at um, all cause mortality um, across the country. Sorry, the, the, the heading of this slide is incorrect for some reason. This is, this is all cause mortality in South Africa, and this is by week here. And this orange line here is what's expected based on pre figures from previous years, essentially, what we would expect to see with the number of deaths. And so what is useful to follow here is what's happening, what's actually happening with the deaths because you then get a, a real sense of to what extent the, the epidemic is affecting mortality in the country more broadly. And I think, as, as we would expect, when we say there's only 75 deaths, it's clearly too early to see any real effect on the all-cause mortality. So this is something that we need to follow over the next, next few weeks. Just another thing to highlight here is that, of course, as we enter winter, there's a natural increase in the deaths, and some, at least some of that is attributable to the, to the seasonal influenza uh, epidemics that we have. And so again, it's just a reminder, and I know i have always reminding when I do these talks that we are soon, if not already, moving into influenza season. Um, and that's going to create challenges for us here in South Africa that, that really many other countries haven't, haven't yet faced because of the timing um, of, the, of the epidemics in, in different countries. One very interesting thing to note from, from this work that the, that the MRC are producing um, is uh, this figure which shows the now the mortality from non-natural causes again by week and again the forecast here is in orange and the real figures are in black and what you see here is essentially um, almost certainly an effect of the lockdown um, that we've seen quite a substantial decline in uh, trauma deaths, essentially, so road traffic collisions and homicide deaths. So just an interesting observation uh, that, that um, there are effects of the lockdown that are far beyond the, the epidemic that we're dealing with. I just want to finish with two slides, um, which are just giving a little bit of bad news and followed by a little bit of good news. So, this, so the bad news first, uh, some of you may have seen this slightly odd um, information yesterday that, that came out and then didn't come out and was a bit confusing. Essentially, one of the drugs um, that we had some hope for um, this drug called remdesivir. Um, there's some information released yesterday um, that, that suggests that the first proper trial, randomized control trial of that drug, um, has shown no real effect uh, in treating COVID-19. So what happened here was the, the results had been uh, presented to the World Health Organization and then the World Health Organization had 
uh, entered them into a, a spreadsheet, a database of, of all the trials that are being done and that had been released publicly. And then there was a lot of consternation by the, by the company, the drug company, Gilead, that, that said this shouldn't have been released and that the data uh, was being misinterpreted. Uh, but by that time, uh, a lot of uh, journalists and others had, had seen the data and, and got hold of the data. So just a warning that this is, this is uh, very limited information and this is not yet out in, in a publication, a peer-reviewed publication or, or even in a preprint. But it's, it's disappointing news if it turns out uh, to be true that that this drug really had had no real effect in, in uh, disease outcomes. So rather to finish on some better news, um, yesterday in the in the UK, uh, another vaccine trial uh, began. So many of you will be aware there's there's one trial already running in the United States, a, a smallish trial. Um, this trial um, is a phase one and phase two trial. So what that means is that they're, they're testing the safety of the vaccine, but at the same time they're getting some uh, preliminary evidence of whether it, whether it does work to prevent COVID-19. Um, and so this is a trial that will include just over a thousand people in a few different sites in the, in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, and this is a, a trial design where half of the people get this vaccine, which is based on an adenovirus, um, and the other half uh, get a, a widely available meningitis vaccine. And we can discuss the reasons for that if you want. But essentially, this is, this is really, again, something that Tulio and I keep remarking on on these talks is just the remarkable pace of the science that that within four months of of uh, recognizing this new disease uh, we've been able to start a vaccine study in humans um, to, 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 to try and prevent this infection really just a remarkable pace um, of, of scientific development and as we keep saying again that this epidemic is going to change us in many ways as, as a society. It's also going to change us in many ways as a, as a scientific society or scientific community uh, when we think about how science can actually be done uh, if you need to. So I want to just finish there and again thank, thank the, the Big Data Consortium uh, for all the material. <laughs> most of the material in this talk and uh, thank my colleagues on the on the university war room so i hope that just gives us a, a brief update and, and uh, allows us to feed into some some questions and discussion of, of some of the some of the main points yeah <clears throat> thank you very much richard for the for the very very informative talk and for giving us uh, hope that, uh, oh, evidence that South Africa is doing the, 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 the right thing. Yeah, we are not yet as good as Singapore, but, uh, but getting there. Yeah? <clears throat> and also, thank you very much for mentioning the, 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 the importance of, uh, of, uh, of science in, in all this, because every morning when we browse the news and read what happens in, uh, in Washington, without wanting to mention person's name, it, it's quite scary what, uh, what amount of, uh, of fake news and wrong non-scientific information is spread on a daily basis. <clears throat> I would yeah. like now to, uh, to ask Tullio, who has been focusing on the, on the question and answers, <laughs> to, to maybe uh, quickly summarize and, and, and cluster the, the questions that we receive and, and, and pose them uh, to, to Richard, so that we have uh, still another 20, 25 minutes <clears throat> in which we could uh, address some of the issues raised by the more than 300 participants by now. Thank you, Tulio. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, Richard, yeah, I have organized it the same way that I did with Professor Salim Karim. 
the questions in different topics. Eh? And, and so I will start with the first one to you. So, so the first one would fall in the topic of, of, of flattening the curve, yeah. And, and, and the question from one of our, uh, our listeners, eh? is it possible for us to follow the example of South Korea and reduce the number of new infections to almost zero fairly quick? If, and if not, why not? Okay. Um, I think South Korea, um, I think most people know uh, this, this, this success of South Korea or the apparent success of South Korea at the moment. Um, a lot of that is driven by the large, or we think is driven by the large scale testing that they, that they are doing there and the infrastructure that they, they put in place uh, to make testing widely available. And obviously, to, to some extent, we are, we are uh, trying to mirror that and to some extent even going beyond that in our uh, active case finding in the community, in, in sending the community health workers out into the community to, to find cases in the community and not wait until uh, people turn up at a health facility or a hospital. I think for us, it's still early days to see what effect that's really ha having, uh, how many cases are being found. Is it helping us to, to understand the epidemic and to, to understand where the transmission is happening in the country, in provinces, in, even within districts? And I think that, that, that that's going to be interesting to follow again over the next few weeks is to really see to what extent that's helping us. Um, obviously, that's the objective of, of the testing and the, and the community testing campaign is to really try and snub out transmission before it gets a hold in a, in a certain area, in a certain community. I personally think it's it's unlikely that we're going to going to be able to to replicate the success of South Korea in terms of getting down to to, to uh, zero new infections. Uh, I think that we have a lot of challenges here um, in terms of um, our healthcare facilities still, um, and I think that time will tell. But I I, I think. Again, there's a there's a danger a little bit of of too many comparisons with other with other countries, and of course we're at fault because we show you all these graphs comparing against other countries. But I think that, as Prof Abdul Karim said last week, we have to understand our epidemic and our response as a as a unique thing, and do uh, and have a tailored response that is right for South Africa. Um, so I think um, it's unlikely that we'll achieve that, but, but uh, let's all work hard to, to achieve the best we can. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you Richard. So, so this led me to... Can I just ask you to please, uh, before that, stop sharing your screen. I think that people would love to to see you on the big screen. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, 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 <laughs> so my second question is, is led perfect. So, so, so it's quite clear. Eh? South Africa have been doing fantastically well on scaling the case. Yeah. But as you highlight, there is some logistical problems, and not only in the case, only in the tests. And so, one of the questions of our, one of our uh, listeners is about. Also, the turnaround time of tests that, that is around three to four days. And also, what's the logistical uh, approach? Because once uh, someone, uh, before they test, they should go in quarantine and have to isolate a person under investigation. Eh? And, and do we have the capacity to, to do that in our hospitals and in our systems to really yeah, quarantine and isolate everyone? And if you can just comment on that, on, on that challenge. 
Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's a very important, uh, important question and important point that the, 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 the turnaround time is important if, if it's impacting on, on what you need to do on the basis of that result. Um, so you're quite right that if somebody is suspected of having COVID-19, then they should already be, be recommended to be isolated. And that can be in a facility or at home, depending on the on um, how unwell they are and on the whether the home circumstances are are suitable for uh, self isolation. I think that one of the key points here is that because we bought ourselves time with this with the with the lockdown and we've had these few weeks, it has given us time as a health system to prepare uh, and, to, and to get ready for uh, the, the, the kind of increasing number of cases. And so many facilities um, do now have the systems in place uh, to isolate people uh, once they're suspected of having COVID and to wait for the result. Um, now, Often that's not isolated in a separate room from everybody else. It may be that you're isolated and, and together with other people who are, who are suspected of having COVID. But that's, that's what's recommended is to have, have these systems of, of cohorting people. So you have one ward for confirmed cases, you have another ward for uh, persons under investigation, this PUI that you referred to. And so many of our private hospitals and public hospitals now have that system uh, well established and, and operating. Um, and so in, 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 in answer to the question, the, the isolation shouldn't depend on the turnaround time, is that the isolation should happen once you once you determine that this person is a person under investigation. Now, whether that always happens or whether things sometimes slip through the net is another question. And then our worry is still that some facilities have been a bit slower at, at preparing and getting these systems ready. And, and what we need to do now is to make sure that everybody is is, is really up to speed and that everybody's learning from each other as to what the right approach is for, for a different type of hospital. If it's a big level two, level three hospital or a smaller kind of rural um, district hospital. So I think just to summarize, that, that is something that's been happening in the background as we've had time to, to, to put the preparation in. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. So, so I, I have one uh, last question about testing for you. It has been asked by many of our viewers, yeah, including uh, Dr. Kanye from the, the head of the virology of the NHLS. So it's always good to hear some of her questions. Yeah. And that's, uh, and that's about antibody tests. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah, what we know about the science of antibody tests and if they are a valid test for people that got infected already, especially healthcare personnel. Okay, great. I, I, I suspected this question was going to come up and I, I, I wanted to put a slide in on it, but then um, I found it quite confusing what I was trying to put together, so I, I left it out. Um, so, so to start with, in terms of testing for antibodies, we first have to understand what the antibody response to the infection is. And we're starting to get some understanding of that. Uh, a number of studies coming out showing that um, most people seem to develop an antibody response, as with most viral infections, uh, within a week or two of, of having symptoms of, of the infection, uh, you can detect antibodies in the in the blood and there's different types of antibody which are which is not so important to understand um, but there are some worrying uh, signs coming out that that for some people uh, there may be quite a limited antibody response 
um, and they may not even have detectable antibodies. And that may be people that have a, a very mild, a mild form of disease or, or asymptomatic infection. And so I think that's something that we need to understand very clearly because that has an implication not only for testing, but potentially for the, the risk of being reinfected with the virus. And that's another common question that we get about whether people can be reinfected or, or whether they're protected after a single infection. And again, we just don't know the answer to that yet. But coming back to the testing, there's a number of tests that have been developed uh, to, to test for these antibodies. And I think many countries are trying to, to, to validate these tests and to find the test that, that will work in, in their context. And I think a lot of people are struggling because the performance of some of these tests is quite poor. And whether that's because of the test itself or because of the, the antibody response, we, we need to find out. Um, can you can probably tell us more herself about, about exactly how, what the progress is with the NHLS here in terms of uh, and the NICD of, of validating the antibody assays. But my understanding is we're not yet at the stage where we've, we've got an antibody test that, that is ready to be used here in South Africa. In terms of the application of, a, of an antibody test, um, there's a bit of confusion still about this. This is not a test that, that is used to detect disease, to, to detect the infection. Um, it's a test that's used to, to show that somebody has been infected um, in the past. And so what you're seeing now is where it's being applied is in what we call serological surveys. And that's where you go into a population and you test everybody in the population or you test a, a random sample of the population. And to understand how many people, what proportion of that population have been infected. And we're starting to now see some results of these studies come out. And again, I, I didn't want to present because the, there's a lot of controversy about some of these early studies and the data they're presenting, um, partly because of this issue of whether the tests are actually um, performing well enough to give us the data. But just in short, the important thing that they're showing us is that there's not a huge proportion of the population have been infected, even if you go into a, an area where there's been a, a very significant local outbreak. Um, so some of the figures that have come out in, in one small study from, from Germany in, in a place where there was a kind of outbreak there was about 14 percent uh, of people had antibodies uh, to the virus something similar was reported yesterday from from new york um, that about 14 15 percent of people uh, had detectable antibodies um, but other studies from other places have shown more like two two to three percent of the population and, and that's what the WHO kind of summarized a couple of days ago, was saying that essentially these studies are showing, that, showing us that maybe around 2 to 3% of the population have been infected. So, so the, the key take-home message there is, is, is just that this means there's not a huge amount of asymptomatic infection that we haven't been aware of. There's not a huge number of people that have been infected and never known they were infected. Um, and, and that some people were still holding out for the hope that that might be the case because that would mean we, we might get to herd immunity much more quickly than we think. Um, but that's not the case. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Richard. Also, also leads perfectly to my third point. Yeah, when I asked the question, in case you want some some water, uh, we have been yeah. talking a lot. 
<laughs> but so 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 my third question it it it, it linked perfect. It's about localized outbreaks. Yeah. So so just to give the example where uh, one of the, the big success countries in the world, Singapore, yeah, have have a very large outbreaks in dormitories of works workers, very similar what South Africa has, what we call hostels, yeah. And in the last few weeks, we have been heard, uh, listening about out localized outbreaks in South Africa in hospitals, work environment like factories, bakery, pharmacies, and jails and funerals. Yeah, can you highlight if you if you expect these localized outbreaks to happen? Yeah, and what about the role of quick outbreak response to control these localized outbreaks? Yeah, good, good question, and I and I think that, that, that that's definitely the case. That the the worry is that these institutional um, outbreaks become amplifiers of of transmission in the community, uh, because because often the transmission, even if it's initially localized to that institution, whether it's a hospital or a prison or a or a, a workplace, um, that often will then spill over into the community and, and amplify the, the, the transmission. I, I think we do expect to see more of that. I think that we, we knew or, or we had concerns that it might be the case uh, from understanding of the previous coronavirus uh, pandemics. We, we know that SARS um, was to a large extent um, a nosocomial spread infection. So, so by that I mean um, that hospital uh, outbreaks were very predominant in, in the SARS epidemic. And the same is true of the, of the MERS epidemic. Um, and I think that's what we're starting to see here, that we have seen these outbreaks in, in some hospitals um, that were affected early on in the epidemic. Um, and, and what that's telling us is telling us something about the virus, that the virus can spread very easily in, in a hospital environment or in any environment where there's, where there's a lot of close contact between people. And I think that that gives us very important lessons about how the virus spreads and about how we can uh, prevent the spread and, and a lot of that comes back to all the simple messages that, that, that you're getting and, and really highlights the important messages about, about hand hygiene, um, about physical distancing. Um, and um, we, have to, we have to think very clearly about how, how we prevent these kind of outbreaks in, in hospitals and institutions. Um, and and, and that's, that's been a big concern of mine over the past few weeks is, is, is trying to think about that and, and, and what do we need to do uh, to protect our healthcare workers um, and to, to protect the, the, the hospitals. Okay, thank you very much. So, 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 so there was many questions also about about vaccines. Yeah, and and one of the questions was was from Anesh, uh, our head of the UK Zen Foundation. Yeah, highlighting like, did they develop a vaccine for SARS and MERS? Yeah, and for SARS coronavirus too, or the virus that infect uh, that cause COVID. I, sorry, Tulio, you just cut out a bit. Did, okay, but I think so, the question so, was, did, did we develop vaccines for the other coronaviruses? Yes, yes, yes. and why yeah, and, and, and why would you expect to develop something for this coronavirus? Yeah, maybe yeah, if you can highlight also the, the difference of the response of how much how many groups are working on that now versus the, the previous outbreaks. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, vaccines were developed for the previous coronaviruses. And I, I think one of the reasons that this Oxford group has been able to get their study uh, going so quickly is, is that um, 
they had previously developed a vaccine for, uh, I, I forget now whether it was the original SARS or the MERS, but they had developed a vaccine for one of the, one of the previous coronaviruses. And so that was why they were able to, <clears throat> to um, develop this vaccine very quickly and, and get going with, with human studies. Um, I think um, th that it's clear that now we were in a position where there's much more collaboration again in, in the vaccine world. And uh, th sometimes people don't understand the level of collaboration between these teams. And I was following the, 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 the UK media yesterday, and, and people always like to uh, make this out as a competition. And so, the, so the, most of the press was saying this race for a vaccine between the Oxford group and the Imperial group. And they make it out that this is a battle, a battle of scientists. But actually the reality is very different that all these groups are working incredibly closely together, um, sharing protocols, sharing uh, uh, information. And, and that's really uh, one of the great things, again, about this is, is seeing the, the collaboration, colla collaborative science for, for the greater good. Um, and I think the reality about the previous epidemics was uh, that with the original SARS epidemic, um, really the, the public health measures uh, were enough to control that, that pandemic. So, so the good public health measures uh, managed uh, on its own without a vaccine to, to control things. So by the time anybody was developing a vaccine, there was no, no infection left. Um, and so the trials wouldn't be able to be done. And with the MERS, it's a little bit similar, is that's really been uh, quite a slow growing uh, epidemic or, or pandemic. Um, and so, uh, testing vaccines becomes very, very difficult. And we've seen that a little bit with the drugs, uh, even with COVID, is that um, I think you heard with my first talk that the, the huge number of clinical trials that had been set up to test drugs in China. But by the time a lot of them were going, the number of cases was already dwindling. And, and in fact, many of these trials then have not been able to recruit the number of participants that they need because, because they got the epidemic under control. Okay. Now, I don't think that's going to be a, a, a major problem for us here or in Europe. There's still more than enough cases uh, to do proper high quality clinical trials of, of drug treatment. And again, the UK has a large trial with now 7,000 people enrolled testing various different drug treatments. So the, I think we're, we're much quicker and, and, and much further ahead with the science than, than previously. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just, just, I just have the last question is going to be in your speciality, but, but thank you very much for the, 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 the last answer because highlight the importance of doing things quick, but also properly, uh, running proper trials and, 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 and do that. And we, and, and we are in a pandemic, we have to do that quick. But my last question, it's related just for, for some clinical. Yeah, we, we all know that you are a clinician, yeah. <laughs> and if we can highlight some, some especially on the death, the patients, uh, that can can lead to death, uh, such as yeah, what's the effect of, of diabetes, hypertension, uh, yeah, obesity, or previous different um, yeah diseases that people have that that led them to a, a high death rate. Sorry, again, you cut out, Tulio. We, we, I, I get that it's about deaths, but we, are you asking about generally across the world what we're learning about deaths or? Yes, yes, yes. If you can highlight the, the role of comorbidities, yeah, different uh, diseases that led people to, to die of or infected with COVID ID. Okay. Yeah, so, so I mean, I think that, that there's a lot of consistent information now that, that 
obviously the risk of death is higher with with increasing age um, so and and beyond that there is also a, a, a link with with various comorbidities um, high blood pressure diabetes um, obesity chronic heart disease chronic lung disease all these things put somebody at, at higher risk of of dying from from COVID. Um, I think though one of the important messages that's that's coming through and, and maybe didn't initially um, from China but but now that we see more information from Europe and, and the US is that despite this we're still seeing young healthy people with no comorbidities dying from COVID um, and I think that's important and I think that we're seeing that in healthcare workers, but also in the general population. And if you look at the data from intensive care units now in, in many European countries, um, the intensive care units are, are not filled with elder, very elderly people with lots of comorbidities. They're filled with, with often younger people um, and possibly with, with, without any comorbidities. So whilst it's clear that, that these comorbidities and the age increases our risk of dying, an important, it's important for the public to understand that, that, that it is also um, that there are younger people dying, younger people without comorbidities. And, and that's important for us in South Africa to, to understand. Yeah, Francesco, it's up. It's to you to close down. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for the uh, really, really very in, in informative talk. And uh, a big thank you to, to Tulio as well for doing such a fantastic job of uh, of moderating the many, many questions and clustering them in, uh, in reasonable chunks for, <laughs> for Richard to, to provide the answers. Also, I, I also want to thank uh, again uh, Richard and, and Tullio for, for bringing up again and again this, this, this concept of, uh, of, uh, of how we are changing the way we do science. Yeah? We, we, we all embraced the kind of open science uh, concept yeah? that we all we do, we, we, we publish openly all the data you find in, in, in GitHub, in repositories where everybody in the world is able to, to access them and, and, and play with them and, and, and contribute in, in, in one way or another. <clears throat> I think this is, this is very important and I'm, and I'm pretty sure that it will stay with us long after, <laughs> long after COVID as a general way of, uh, of, uh, of producing scientific res results in, in a much more efficient way than, than before. <clears throat> yeah? And this leads me quite naturally to a, uh, to a little advert. Yeah? Uh, Richard and Tulio mentioned a few times the, 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 the COVID consortium that we have established uh, at UKZN, <clears throat> which was a kind of a, a spontaneous gathering of, um, of scientists of various disciplines from, from medicine to computer science to theoretical physics and mathematics. <clears throat> And, and, and many others. And, and we've launched a, um, a, a fundraising campaign on, on Back, a, Back a Buddy. And I've put the link in, 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 in the chat if you, if you are happy to contribute to support uh, this initiative, which will mainly focus on COVID now, but will probably lead to, to many more interesting things in the, in, uh, in the future. So let me then uh, conclude again by uh, advertise second advert. Our next uh, <laughs> data breakfast won't be next week Friday because it's a public holiday. And although for all practical purposes, it will make a big difference in the life of most of us, but uh, we, we just try to, to, to stick to the usual uh, way of uh, respecting the, the public holiday. So in two weeks time, we will meet again. <clears throat> uh, a few of you asked in the chat, whether we post this talk on online, uh, we will post it on the in the YouTube channel of, um, of of Data Breakfast, so you will find it there in probably in an hour or so, if you want to share it with, with other people. And <clears throat> before concluding, I, I want to thank also the people that made all this possible. I want to thank Kimara, who is in charge of our public relations of Data Breakfast, of Ilya. <clears throat> 
who is the, 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 the video recorder of note, yeah? but also all the people in the, in the COVID consortium of UKZN who every day try to keep us updated with, with what is happening on the data side of, 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 of the spread of the disease. So I wish all of you, <clears throat> in particular, the more than 300 participants that we had today, uh, a great day. And, uh, and in particular, stay safe and follow the advice of Richard during your interactions with other people. So thank you very much again to everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.